Hi, and welcome to the National New Teacher Support Podcast brought to you by New Teacher University. We're so excited to have you again with us this evening, new teachers here at New Teacher University. We, ha we have a veteran teacher, speaker, author, and coach with us today. And she is going to give us some dynamic information that's really going to save you in your career. And it's gonna help you get started on the right foot. So we're excited to have you with us, new teachers. We're always here for you at New Teacher University. We are the podcast for teachers, by teachers, because we want you learning from each other and from people that are effective and in the classroom. We have always award-winning teachers and administrators with us sharing with you. So you can always be excited about the content that we're going to bring you. I'm your host, Dr. Terry Ross. And again, I'm excited to have with me this evening, uh, Ms. Jennifer Felton. Again, she is a veteran teacher, coach, author, and speaker. And she's just written her new book, teaching in the now classroom momentum begins with you and she sent me a copy of it and i read it and i went through it and i was so excited it was about so many chapters in there that i liked and i told her this is a really nice book with a lot of information in it and i ran across chapter 15 and i got excited about that but before we get into which chapter we're going to talk about today miss felton will you introduce yourself and tell us why did you write teaching in the now and let us know how did you get to this point Good evening, everyone. Yes, so my name is Jennifer Felton. I am an author. I am a consultant. I am a forever educator. And I am here tonight to share with you uh, why I wrote the book. And so in its simplest form, I wanted to share what I learned in my 20-year teaching career. And so what brought me to uh, write this book was I just totally have enjoyed working with teachers. And throughout my years, um, supporting teachers, veteran teachers, supporting new teachers, supporting teachers who are ready to run out of the building, you know, just supporting this work, um, I wanted to share with them some of the things that it took me a long time to learn. And I feel like I was blessed with a great new teacher mentor she uh, always kept it straight with me. She always told me what I need to know at that moment. And so I wanted to be able to share that with other educators and just say, hey, here's what I'm seeing. Here's what I've experienced. And I just wanted to leave that legacy. Yes. Well, thank you. And in looking in this book and all the information that you put in here, you really left that legacy and I'm excited. And we settled on chapter 15. Tell yes. us about chapter 15. You said it's lifting the curtain on what? <laughs> sarcasm in the classroom. Yes, lifting the curtain on sarcasm in the classroom. And you talked about the, the title of the chapter was Durant. And I kind of skipped past the chapter when I first started looking in the book and seeing what I wanted to read and going back and forth. And I basically read through every chapter. And when I got back, I made the rent the last one because I said, the last thing I want to hear is a rant. And when I read it, it was the first thing that I should have read because it was excellent and it talked about sarcasm and I see so many people use sarcasm. So can you tell us what is sarcasm? Well, when I work with educators, um, you know, I try to help them understand that sarcasm for me is just an ineffective tool, um, especially when we look at so many other tools we can use in the classroom. Um, sarcasm is a way to regain control. Oftentimes I see it being used that way. Sarcasm is a uh, tool for fear because that's what it breeds in children. Um, but, you know, if we look at the definition of sarcasm, it translates to the cutting of the flesh. That's what it translates to. And I think- Wait a minute, don't just pass by that. Could you say that again for me? Wow, I felt so that. The, the definition, when we look at the etymology and we look at it, it it's the cutting of the flesh. Yeah. That's what it's- it's meant to do, right? And so I see it being used quite often in, in classrooms, um, but I just try to help teachers who I work with 
see what I call truth of actions. So if we were to expand the classroom mm -hmm. and you expand the sarcasm, not just how the sarcasm lands on that one student, how does that land on everyone? Yes. How does the use of sarcasm land on the students who are showing what I call the desired behavior? They 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 still they still absorb it. Yeah. They still have to do something with it. And so, you know, I I try to help educators use other tools instead of sarcasm to gain control because that's really what we want to do in that moment, right? Sometimes in that moment we want to you know, gain control and assert our power. And sarcasm is a great tool for that. And, and I like the way you elevated the fact that how does it land on the students that are given the, the desired behavior? The desired because behavior. Because it contaminates the whole community mm -hmm. when you mm -hmm. use sarcasm. It's like a dog whistle to mm -hmm. make them not do this or not do that. So mm -hmm. tell us, how, how does it affect the whole classroom? How does sarcasm affect the whole classroom? So when I talk about it, I, I try to first and foremost take the interaction from just you and the misbehaving student. Let's say it's a misbehaving student or a student who you, you know, you want to try to get your message across to. Because sometimes we villainize the misbehaving student. And yeah. because they're misbehaving, they're the villain. So they deserve what they get, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I want you to not think about them. Think about uh, your, your, your prize student. How do they absorb what you're saying? Think about your quiet student. How do they absorb it? Think about your student who doesn't speak the language. How do they absorb it? Because they, they do absorb it. And one of the things that it does is it causes what I call self-muting. And the reason I say self-muting is because we have to remember that these are children. And so they're going to respond to whatever it is we, we do in the room. And so if I want to be the good kid and I always want to be the good kid and I never, I never want to feel what Johnny just felt, I'm going to be quiet. I'm not going to say anything, even when I have something to say even when I might know the answer, even when it may be bubbling up inside of me to share, but what if I don't get it right? Yes. What if the teacher chooses to use sarcasm against me? Some kids can take it on the chin, but some, for some it's devastating and they kind of you know deal with it internally. They deal with it quietly. And, and I love I love that you elevated even the child that does not speak the language because I had a football coach shout out to uh, Big C and he would say Carl Roberts he would always say pain is universal son everyone understands it so everyone understands and so although that's not a physical pain it's universal because it shifts the atmosphere when you come back at a child a certain way. Mm -hmm. And that child is just being an 11 year old. They're they're experiencing language there uh, or they may be a 16 year old that's testing new boundaries mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and their confidence could be at their highest that day. And when you say that thing or whatever it is, you did that gesture. Mm -hmm. Even that child that can't speak the language, they feel that because they see what it did to their classmates. So thank you for sharing that, how it's just, how it cuts across the room. It cuts across the room. The teacher for me, um, you know, is the center of the uh, of that universe. Yes. You are the center. Your energy projects on every single child, whether or not you interact with that child, you know, your energy lands on them. Yes. And so they feel it. Like if I'm a child and I'm like, you know, going back and forth with the teacher and the teacher yes. cuts me with sarcasm and I'm like, oh, 
you know, it because sometimes that sarcasm could stop you in your tracks, right? I, I mean, yes. I've been on both ends of it. And so it'll stop you in your track. And the the energy shift is felt in the room because you know, you have the kids in there, they're like, Ooh, she yes. got you. She yes. got you. You're not gonna do that again. You know, yes. kids like that's what kids do. Yes. And sometimes, yes. you know, we don't we don't know how it lands everywhere else. And what I've seen is children choose to be quiet. They choose now not to engage because they don't want to misstep. Because if I misstep, I'm, I might get it. And nobody wants to get it. Now, some kids, they don't mind getting it. You know, they used to it. They, 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 they want to go with you toe for toe, but that's not everybody's story. Yes. And so just kind of think about what you are about to say and how it may impact the other children in the room. Mm -hmm. And that is what I call truth of action. That is the truth of what your action will do. Not what you thought it would do, not what you hope it did, but this is what it did. And, and, and sometimes it hurts. Yes, yes, it does. Yes, it does. So thank you so much for sharing that, uh, how it affects the whole classroom. Is there any other, anything else you'd like to share in that space uh, about okay. our children? So one of the things, I, and again, to me, I list seven unintentional things, right, that okay. can happen. So one of the things that you do is you you bring fear into your classroom, right? Wow. Yes. You bring fear into the classroom because kids fear, um, you know, being victim of it. Yes. And when kids feel fear, they begin to do what I call self-preservation. They begin to try to preserve themselves by any means necessary. So I do not want other children laughing at me. I do not want the teacher <laughs> laughing at me. I do not want to be put on display. So that creates what I call self-preservation. From there, one of the unintentional results of self-preservation is self-muting. So self-muting means I'm just going to be quiet. And for some kids, I want, I want every teacher out there to just do this for me for one moment. There are some children in your classroom who are invisible. They have made themselves invisible. And this happens over time. They have made it where you don't really see them. And that's, and for some kids, that's by design. They don't want you to see them. They don't want you to engage with them for whatever reason we don't know. But Part of self-muting is I become invisible. And if you don't call on me, I don't say anything. And if you do call on me, I may hesitate to speak. And when kids do this, when they self-mute and they're in this self-preservation phase, it reduces their ability to learn. Like they can only, I can only process so many thoughts at one time. And for me, if I'm in a classroom with excessive sarcasm and I'm watching it, it is a form of bullying. But I'm just yes. gonna I'm just gonna lay yes. that out. Yes. That's what I call the elephant in the room that people, you know, I get pushed back, but that is mm -hmm. a form of bullying. Yes. And so if I have reduced co cognitive capacity, um I'm not learning as much as I should be because I'm worried about preserving myself. I'm worried about staying invisible. Um, and if this is a tool that teachers are constantly using, it reduces their ability, kind of puts up a wall for them to have these genuine relationships with students, which leads to burnout. And you're not being as fulfilled in your role, but also it, if you are getting the response that you want, which is a quiet classroom, right? Because sometimes that's why you do it. You want you want to hush people up. Um, it reduces your ability to bring in other high impact strategies that are more effective. And so 
all of those for me creates like a toxic classroom environment. It might be quiet. It may appear to be going smoothly, but sometimes it reduces academic achievement. And, and it's one of those things I call a hidden barrier that we don't always see. Yes. And listening to you, I'm just thinking about the genius that's been uh, suppressed and stifled in, a, in that type of environment. And how children take that in life with them, because you, you can probably even right now, I may be unpacking some things like I know. So why have you always done this? I'll ask myself that sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I began to unpack, I'll see it's something that someone said to me or some in situation that I was in. And oftentimes as I unpack those things, I'm like, oh, well, I'm glad they did tell me that, you know, because that was very helpful for me. Now, sometimes I may not have liked the delivery. Right. But as a child, that's just the way you receive things sometimes. But what you're talking about is this just outright sarcasm, sarcasm for control. And I yeah. like that you brought it back to the teachers because when you can't build those relationships, then you do have burnout because the children know how to get you. They will. And when I say get you, they don't mean to get you. It's just that if you are if you're always being sarcastic with them, they have their ways of dealing with that as well as a group. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're always being sarcastic with me, I, I, I'm under attack. I feel attacked. Whether we want to call it that, you know, I, that was a personal attack on me as, an, as a student. And so as I, I may act on that, depending on what type of child I am. So and some children self-mute. Some some students launch revenge. <laughs> you never and, know. and we know that children in poverty and children that's in high stressful situations, oftentimes because they can't flight, they're going to fight. And that's those outbursts that we see sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we don't know what led to those outbursts. And then sometimes in the videos, you can see what led to them. So I understand what you're saying now that and, and when you're one of the things in poverty, oftentimes the children who are coming out of high stressful situations, one of the only things you have is your pride. Mm. And when someone hits that. You've got to do something about it. That's kind of the that's one of the rules of the culture sometimes. And okay. we're trying to unpack that absolutely, but that's sometimes what we're seeing. So thank you so much for sharing that. So let's come over to the bright side of this for a little while. Can I give what you one quick example though before we come on to the bright side just to seal it? Do what? Can I give you one quick example before we come over to the yes, bright side? Yes, please. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, thank you. You know, you, you mentioned the culture. You mentioned, you know, when we watch some of these videos, you mentioned fight or flight, and you mentioned pride. And so imagine you just came to school with your brand new Jordans on or your brand new LeBrons or whatever it is, your brand new iPhone, your brand new outfit. I don't know what the kids are wearing nowadays. Yes. You know, your brand new hairdo. And a teacher hits you with, oh, I see you got the new LeBrons on, but you don't have a pencil. Listen, I didn't come here for that today. <laughs> Not with my new LeBrons. <laughs> you know, and so I came with confidence high and that was an attack. Yes. That was an attack, you know, and we don't always see it that way because we want to drive home the point of school supplies or drive home whatever point we want to drive home, but at what cost? Right, right. You know, at what cost? Now you've created a barrier between you and a child. Um, and it's not worth it, not in today's landscape of learning. I cannot, I don't have the time to tear down walls and build them back up and tear them down. I, I need to keep those barriers at bay because the kids are already coming with too many, too many barriers. When you could easily just compliment those LeBrons and then say, Oh, you were so busy getting fresh this morning. You walk on up here and get you a pencil too. And let's you know, moving. something like that. Come, let, let's put those LeBrons to work this morning. Come and get you a pencil. You Come know, move. compliment yeah. them, offer the pencil, keep moving. And keep it moving. Yes. I, I don't I don't need to hear about how 
I got a new phone and you don't have one. And that's, that's not my problem. I have no control over that. <laughs> yes. Now, one of the things I did as a principal one year, um, and I did it from years after that is this, I did, I noticed a lot of write-ups coming to the office about not having supplies. I said, we're tied to one school. One day at faculty meeting, I think I took about 5,000 pencils to faculty mm -hmm. meeting. 10 cases of those 500 each. Mm -hmm. Told teachers just come and get pencils. It may have been more than that because some of them could just walk out with boxes of 500. If right. the child come, there's no pencil, give them another. Let's keep moving. We'll we'll work on the responsibility right now. We're teaching them, you know, some academic things. And if we can give them a pencil and they cut down off of 15 minutes of class, let's do that. Right. That's because also we have a situation that we're in some environments that the child don't even know where they slept last night. Right. And they, school. you know, and when you attack them about not having that pencil, you not only attack them, you're attacking their home environment. And although you're just mentioning it, as you said, they see it as an attack. So you're exactly right. And thank you for elevating that in the conversation for our children. So new mm -hmm. teachers, I hope you heard that. Uh, and this is how sarcasm, this is how it affects our children. So let's make sure that we're not using sarcasm. This can save you a lot in the long run because it can help you build relationships. I'm so glad that that was elevated because building those relationships, if you build relationships with your students, they will move mountains. They'll think they're moving them for you, but they're really moving them for themselves. Mm -hmm. So let's build bridges and not burn them. So thank you so much. Now let's move over to the bright side with it. Let's look at what are some alternatives to sarcasm? What are some things that you've coached teachers around and some things that you've learned over the years that you can use to help build those relationships and encourage our children? So this is this is one. And, you know, like you said, you read the book. So you kind of have an idea of who I am. Yes. And, you know, I, I just cut straight to it. One of the biggest things that you can do to cut down on your sarcasm is be over prepared for your lesson. Right. So oftentimes when I'm uh, observing or working with a group or school, the sarcasm begins to creep in excessively when you are not prepared. Yes. So, you know, you're trying to 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 teach a lesson that might be just a little dry. The lesson dry. Let's just say the lesson is dry. And. Kids get a little distracted. They might be wanting to say, you know, start a side conversation. And then you hit them with the sarcasm to, to you know, to assert dominance again and to bring things back under control. So the number one thing is be prepared because if the lesson is moving and it is, and it's engaging and it's timely and it's relevant, and you have planned for different personalities in your classroom. Yes. It it you you find yourself with less confrontational um strategies being used. The other thing I say is Q tip. There's a chapter in the book called Q tip. Let, let me go back to over planning. I just heard a coach tell a new teacher the other week. The teacher said, Well, what about those students over there that are talking? And she said, You know why those students over there are talking? She said, because they don't have anything to do yet. If you had everything ready for them when they walked into the classroom and you were prepared and over-prepared to the end, they would have something to do, she said, because yeah. those are the students that's ready to learn. Yeah. So thank you for it's sharing not, that, being over-prepared. Be over-prepared because, like, you know, if your classroom is 50 minutes and, and you got a 20-minute lesson, you know, you got to be over-prepared. And I am a firm believer in Bell to Bell instruction. Um, you know, when they walk in the door, you got to be ready and yes. you got to have some routines like, you know, give yourself some routines so that you can get kids know what's coming next. And you move through um, like I write your your lessons should run like, you know, the electric slide. Right. Like if anybody knows how to do the electric slide, you can do the electric slide without even thinking about it. Doesn't yeah. matter what happens. You just keep on sliding. And yeah. that's how the class should run. It should run like a song and you should be able to run through it. Kids should know what's about to happen. And then ding, the bell rings, they're on their way. But it's yeah. when 
Nobody don't know what's going on. It's a lot of pauses. You got to find the paperwork. Yes. The lesson just dry. You talking for the whole whole. That's when a lot of times I see the sarcasm come into play. Yes. Um, it it's to help save the teacher. And the good thing about the electric slide, you can do it to any music. It doesn't have to be the same song. So thank you so much for sharing that. Well, I'm excited to hear about this next strategy. I heard you mentioned it and you said Q-tip. So tell us what is Q-tip and how does it fit into the classroom? Q-tip, uh, quit taking it personal. Okay. <laughs> you know, we take things personal. I remember one time, I'll give you a story. Uh, it was it was Black History Month, and um, this was in the early days in Florida when you could celebrate Black History Month, and it could be a part of your classroom culture. So yeah. I came to school in um, a lemon lime head wrap and a and a, like a big green dashiki. You couldn't tell me I wasn't the princess of Zamunda, right? I mean, yeah. I was colorful. Yeah. yeah. And one of my students was like, look at Miss Felton up there looking like a lemon lime Jolly Rancher or something like that. No, no, I think he said a bag of Skittles or something like that. He might have said both. He yes, said yes, both. yes. Skittles, he... lemon lime Jolly Rancher. He probably said both. And you know what I did? I was like, you right. You got me. You, 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 you know, you got me. Yes. He did. I was looking colorful that day. Um. I mean, the class was trying not to laugh, but I was like, y'all go ahead. It's okay. Right, right. Yeah. right. Today. It wasn't personal, you know? Right. Sometimes we forget that these are children and they say things and they are also trying to have social currency, social capital amongst their peer group. So, you know, quit taking it personal. It's okay. Move on. Yes. Get the kid the pencil and move on. Man, them Jay's looking good today. Ooh, your hair looking fly. I know you was out yesterday. You looking amazing today. See, I and call you. all of those investments when you know because everyone wants to be seen. Everyone, and when I say seen, they want to know that they matter. Mm -hmm. they, they mm -hmm. don't just want you looking at them all the time. They want to know that they matter. So when you notice that haircut, you notice that new hairstyle, the new gym shoes, you notice that they weren't at school yesterday. I can remember one time I told a student, I said, uh, you weren't here yesterday. I missed you. And he looked at me and said, for real? And I was like, that, that, I felt that when he said that, you know. So uh, thank you for sharing that. And, and I had you talking about the students t telling you about your clothes. I wore some, uh, our school colors were burgundy and white, maroon and white. So mm -hmm. I had these maroon uh, khakis I had bought and uh, this plaid maroon and white shirt. And I was at school and I had them on with some gym shoes and some maroon and white gym shoes. And a senior walked up to me and he said, <laughs> He said, I like that outfit. He said, but that'll look much better with some brown casual shoes rather than the gym shoes. That's a little overkill. <laughs> so the next time I wore it, I wore it with some brown casual shoes. Mm -hmm. And I went and found him. He said, okay, okay. You know, <laughs> he was yeah. like, and so, but that was like, again, you said social capital for him. But mm -hmm. And I know he's going to be a lawyer somewhere one day because he was always listening to, uh, the announcements in the morning, you know, checking you on them, you know, is can you do this? Just different things. And when he did that, I just loved it. So thank you so much for sharing that. So what are some other things that they can do uh, as an alternative to sarcasm? Like we've been just use make it positive and, yeah. and be and be sincere. You know, like put yourself on the other end of it. And I call it the sarcasm spew. Put yourself on the other end of it. And or put your child on the other end of it yeah. if you have a parent. I mean, if you have children. Yeah. Um, put your niece and nephew on the other end of it. Yes. You know, and would you like that? If not, don't do it. Because, again, kids, they they understand what you're trying to say. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they get it. And so one of the things I always say, say nothing. If you can't be genuine about a you know a comment like, man, your hair looking real nice, or you know whatever it is, oh I see you, oh I see you got the new Louis Vuitton or whatever it is we're saying. If you can't come up with something genuine, say nothing. You don't have to say anything, but just choose 
to me, choose greatness because yeah. these things leave a lasting impression on students. I had a teacher who was extremely sarcastic and I don't, maybe she thought that the class was challenging and she had to constantly use it, but I absorbed it and it felt like I was trapped in that room. And, you know, being trapped in a place that is filled with negativity because you already have what other, whatever other factors coming in. So, you know, you can just say nothing. Um, another one I like is facial expressions. Yes. You said earlier that doesn't matter. Like, I could speak another language. It doesn't matter if I'm, you know, dealing with anything, if, it doesn't matter if I'm gifted, it doesn't matter. Facial expressions can convey a message. Yes. And it's okay to just express whatever it is you, you feel like you need to express, but using facial expressions, um, you know, I think alternatives, the biggest alternative is to know how it lands on others. And yes. once you begin to not only see it as a one-on-one -on -one interaction and you see it as an inter interaction with your entire class, you know, you will make some changes. And, and that's kind of like what I want teachers to see. How does this impact everybody? So be over prepared, smile, you know, you don't have to say anything positive reinforcement, be positive and just be great. Be the leader in that classroom, be the educator you want. And I think, you know, we can use those as alternatives to developing our classroom management toolkit. Yes. Uh, you said that facial expression conveys a message. You don't, not only does facial expression convey a message, we call it attitude, but energy conveys a message. So it's important that before we walk through that building in the morning, we put on our happy song, we put on our happy face, and we walk in because whatever we're going through, we're going to take all of that into the classroom with us. So yeah. let's have our morning affirmations, new teachers. Let's have our morning music that gets us going so that whatever we're going through, we don't convey that to the whole classroom because every teacher can tell that no matter if they were going through something at some point, and especially if they had a relationship with their students, their students would say, are you okay today? And you'll go home and you'll say, my students asked me all day and I tried so hard to, you know, blah, blah, blah. So yeah. if you are really building relationships with your students, they can feel that energy. And even if you don't have a relationship, they feel that even more. And I love that you shared that they've, if you felt trapped, imagine how many students feel trapped today. Oh, yeah. Like me and my close friend, we both had the same teacher. So, we, you know, we still talk about it uh, 30 odd years later, you know. Oh, the, wow. the but but kids know, like, you know, if I'm wearing lipstick and, this, and I'm at work, kids be like, oh, she must be in a good mood today, y'all. She got on some lipstick, you know. See, watching but, you. They, they are watching you. Yes. And so they know you just as well as you know them. They know mm -hmm. you. They know your mannerisms. So if I'm just like, and I don't say anything, and I just give a deaf stare, I call it my Darth Vader stare. Yes. they like, uh-oh, y'all, get it together, get it together. And the other one that I didn't, you know, be willing to share power in your classroom. Yes. So I call it like the super friends, right? So in a classroom, we've been talking, but energy is felt by everyone in that room. Absolutely. And everybody comes into the room with whatever energy they bring in. It's almost impossible for me as a single educator in a classroom, let's say of 25, to you be able to take all of my energy and move the continuum. 
But if you're willing to share power with the other students, you guys can work as a unit to maintain a positive classroom. You don't have to be in control of everything. And so my students know if I begin to have a certain facial expression, they begin to rally and be like, all right, y'all, let's get it together. They begin to come together as a unit to move us into a positive direction. They may say something like, Ms. Felton, can you put on some music? Ms. Felton, can we just take two minutes? And I empower them to do that because it, it just makes it so much easier. Yes. Um, and that is an alternative to using sarcasm. You don't have to be the most powerful person in the room. Share the power so that we can work together as um, I call it, you know, you can call it the Justice League, Team America, whatever. But the goal is to not be a standalone superhero in that classroom, Absolutely. but to use everybody. Well, it, it empowers the students and it gives mm -hmm. them feel like they have some choice in it. And when you give a person choice, you're giving them a lot because now they can take ownership. They can take ownership of that environment. And in order for you to do that, you had given, you had built relationships because when you build those relationships, yes, those students thought that they were doing that for you sometimes. But in the end, when they talk about it 10 years later, they'll talk about how much they learned from you. So yeah. thank you for what you've done for children. And thank you for sharing this with our uh, teachers tonight. So uh, as we get ready to close, do you have any uh, parting remarks about uh, sarcasm that you'd like to share with the new teachers? Yeah, so like I, I always remind the teachers to take it back to when students first started their journey, you know, when they first come in to to school system, right, to kindergarten. And one of the things I would do um, with schools and teachers is we would visit pre-K or we would visit the local elementary and just look at the level of energy in those classrooms. Look at how those students are raising their hands and they want to participate and they want to please you and, and, and be engaged. And so I want you to imagine just a classroom full of young, vibrant five and six year olds. Yeah. And then I want you to think about what we said earlier about the definition of sarcasm, right? So the definition of sarcasm, the cutting of the flesh, to belittle, to undercut, you know, um, to berate. Uh, and I want you to layer that for a moment and just think about how that impacts those students. And, and, and let that sit. And then I want you to, you know, flip it. What if we fed them positive affirmations? Yes. Think about your high school students. Think about your students who have um, some challenges, right? Yeah. What if we fed them more love, more positive affirmations, more growth mindset, more of, uh, I know you don't know how to do it just yet, Yes. but I'm going to keep working with you. Now, tonight, I want you to practice. Now, I know you're going to play uh, Minecraft. Just play it for 10 minutes. But then I want you to come back and put in about 10 more minutes of uh, study time. And we're going to get there. You yes. know, I Give know you strategies. missed the days, but we're going to get there. We're going to get there. And I want you to think how that impacts that student. Because, again, what is, using my saying, your energy lands on everybody in the classroom. So if I'm flowing positive energy out growth energy out, yes. believe in yourself energy out, it still lands on that student who may not be interacting with me. And I'll share one story with you. I had a student, he was super quiet. And I'm like the super cheesy teacher. And I had him in sixth grade. In eighth grade, he wrote me a letter for Teacher Appreciation Day. 
And he never really was a talkative student, never gave any trouble. And he wrote me a letter and he was like, Miss Felton, oh, I just wanted to write you this letter. And I just wanted you to know that I know you didn't have to call on me much, but you know, I just love when we would do this. And I just love how you would say this. And I and I knew sometimes you wanted to fuss at the kids, but you would always just, you know, smile or say something silly. Yes. And that touched me because again, my energy landed on him, even though he didn't engage with me that often. He felt seen. He felt seen. He felt like he mattered because you made sure that you called on him. And in those classes that he sit in and he's invisible, some people allow him to be invisible. So thank you, Ms. Felton, for what you do for children. Thank you for writing this book, Teaching in the Now. Teaching in the Now. Classroom Momentum begins with you by Jennifer Felton. She is a teacher, a speaker, a coach, and an author. So thank you so much. And new teachers, I hope that you take this to heart. I hope that you use this as a place to ground in as you build relationships with your students. Just think about that slate that she talked about, that child coming in, raising his hand, happy, excited. And you keep that going because you're giving them growth mindset language. You're sharing love with them. You're giving them positive affirmations and you're encouraging them rather than cutting at them with sarcasm. So new teachers, I hope, New teachers, I hope that you take this to heart, that you use this information, and that you remember that sarcasm is the enemy of relationships in your classroom. You want to build relationships, you're going to have to build it with growth mindset language. You're going to have to build it with being sincere. And you're going to have to build it with love because you control that classroom. You are the superhero and your energy is the energy that the students are going to feel. Ms. Felton talked about that, that her students could just read her face. So you have the ability to, when you see a student sad, to just make them smile. Tell them, just smile. For no, yes, just smile. For no reason at all, I don't have a joke for you. I just want you to smile because I can't stand and look at you sad. And I can't move until you smile. You can shift that energy or you can say things that can make them sad. So thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you, Ms. Felton. Y'all make sure. Now, where can they get your book? Um, they can always grab a copy on Amazon. It lives there. And um, they can always reach out to me if they would like uh, to keep the conversation going. Follow me on LinkedIn. It's easy to find me, Jennifer Felton. And, um, it, you know, just let me know how you feel about tonight's conversation. And, I, and I'm good. I don't, I don't get offended easily, but that's just my take on it. The well, rant. Thank you. Thank you so much. The rant. Yes, the rant. rant. I love that. Uh, so if you would send me that information, the link to your to your book and the link uh, to your social media sites, I'm going to put that in the podcast and I will tag you on LinkedIn. So thank you so much. I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation at some point. I'm excited about this podcast. I cannot wait until the new teachers get a chance to just really dig into this. So thank you so much for joining us on the National New Teacher Support Podcast, brought to you by New Teacher University. I'm your host, Dr. Terry Ross. New teachers, hang in there. This is episode five. I am so excited that you joined us. And we're going to make it through this semester. And let's make sure you come back after Labor Day. And for those of you that start in school after Labor Day, your first day is after Labor Day, and especially those of you up north and in the Northeast, welcome to the profession. We're excited to have you here. And Tag in and join us on the National New Teacher Support Podcast. We're on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate this. This is so awesome. This is a lot of content. This is just like the book. <laughs> so thank you so much. Let me uh, stop the recording.